Several weeks ago, I did a video on this really low cost signal generator. It comes in kit form. I got it on AliExpress and it's based on the XR2206 chip, which is said to be obsolete, but you can still get those chips. And yeah, it was pretty good actually. Uh, it worked pretty well. I'll leave a link in the description below if you want to take a look at the video. But I was trying to top up my AliExpress order to get it to the threshold to get free delivery. And you can see it was under three quid when I paid. It wasn't 289, I think it was slightly less when I got it. And yeah, it was good. But on the same order, I was actually playing around with these, the 8038 chip, which is similar. Um, but it, uh, one advantage this has is you can actually change the duty cycle on the 8038 and you cannot on the XR2206. And as you can see from my breadboard here, I have been playing around with the 8038 chips that I bought. That's one there. And these two little resistors here, well, that's what allows you to control the duty cycle. One controls the rise time and the other one controls the fall time. So between those two, you can control the duty cycle and it all works good. Then I stumbled on AliExpress again and found another little kitlet. So again, I was trying to top up my order for free delivery. So I put that on the ICL 8038 DIY kit. Not opened it yet, so I thought let's do a little video. We'll put this together, see how it performs, and we'll have a look at the 8038 chip as well. So let's take a look. And there you go, that is the page on AliExpress. It's currently £2.44. Now, AliExpress prices fluctuate up and down all the time. So if you do take a look at it, you might find it's changed by the time you take a look. If we scroll down to the specifications here, there's some comments, specifications here, or some of them. So yeah, it's a signal generator. Frequency range support is five hertz up to 400 kilohertz. Obviously that's adjustable. Um, the power supply is supported is 12 to 15 volts input supply. And there you go, look, duty cycle, approximately two to 95%. So we'll test that out. Um, yeah, it looks good. And here's the block diagram to the 8038 IC, which I've extracted from the data sheet. Now I always like to look at these because it gives you a really good idea of how the chip functions internally. And by understanding that, you then start to realize how the components that you connect to these external pins interact with the internal workings. So firstly, you need to be aware that when you charge a capacitor like this one here with a constant current source, then the capacitor will charge at a linear rate. And when you discharge with a constant current source, it will discharge at a linear rate. That's how you get this triangle wave. Unlike when you charge with a constant voltage and a resistor, that gives you an exponential charge and discharge. This will give you a nice linear line like that. So that's how you get the triangle wave. So to start out, this capacitor C, which you connect between pins 10 over here and your ground or your negative supply, is charged through this constant current source I. So that will charge up to a set threshold and then it will trigger this comparator here when it reaches that threshold. The threshold then triggers the flip-flop and the flip-flop turns this transistor on and this current source then starts to discharge the capacitor through this route. Now you probably think, well actually you're still charging here and discharging here, how's that gonna work? Well you can see here, this charges at a rate of I and this discharges at a rate of two I. So therefore you are actually discharging that capacitor at a rate of I. So the charge and discharge rate will be equal and that's how you get this nice even triangle wave. And then when the capacitor drops to another threshold, then comparator two triggers and then resets the flip-flop. This turns off and then it starts charging again. You go around the whole cycle again. And you can see down here, well, the flip-flop turning on and off gives you a nice square wave output on pin nine there. Uh, your triangle wave, well, that's coming directly off the your capacitor there through a buffer to be able to drive some current. So that gives you a nice triangle wave. And then that goes into a sine converter, just rounds off the tops and bottoms and gives you a nice sine wave output. And over here, pin four and five, that's where you add the resistors to adjust the duty cycle. So one leg will affect the rising edge of the triangle wave, and the next leg will adjust the falling edge of the triangle wave. And of course, if you do that, then that will affect the output here to your square wave, and it will also affect the sine wave output, because it's all derived from the triangle wave to start with. All right, so that's roughly how it works. Let's get back to the bench and have a look at that kit then. Okay, and there it is. And I've just noticed actually, it does actually say no case. So I was right, it doesn't contain a case. I thought so when I felt the packaging. So let's open it up, see what we got then. 
little staple there. And a more bubble wrap. Okay. Right, there we go. Quite a few components there. Um, got more ICs than expecting. Let's have a look at those in a second. Some potentiometers. This the instructions. Or just a part list. Uh, yes, yeah, so that's the PCB. Little circuit diagram. And that's not a lot of use, is it? So, um, yeah, we'll try and work this out. Uh, now, what are these other ICs? Let's just take a quick look at that. Right, I've just taken a closer look, and you can see on here, actually, one is a TL082, which is an op amp or operational amplifier, and this one is the ICL7660S. Brilliant. So I've done a video on that. It's a, basically a voltage converter, and I think, looking at this, they're using it to provide a negative voltage rail for, these, for the op amp. So I'll leave a link in the description of the ICL7660S. And in the middle there, that is the 8038 chip, all right? And on the back, they've given you some sockets. One's just fallen out there. So that's good. There's the PCB. So basically, all of that now needs to get onto there. So let's get that uh, all soldered in then. Now, you might be pleased to know I ain't going to do a great big long video soldering all this in. So let's do it the quick way. And there you go, all soldered in. I've also plugged in the ICs and put the jumpers into their top positions. Now, the instructions don't actually tell you what what each of these dials do so yeah it's going to be a bit of reverse engineering to find out what each one does and these up here so maybe let's have a look at this schematic and here it is i've scanned it in and just enhanced it a little bit so you can see it clearer up here is the power coming in so your 12 volts comes in through this jack and then you can see you get nine volts out so this here is the voltage regulator it's a nine volt regulator and that's using the 78 lo9 regulator and just to the left of that, well, you can see I've got 9 volts coming in here, which has obviously come from that regulator there. And then this is outputting our minus 9 volts. So that is the voltage inverter, and that's the part using that 7660S chip. And down here, well, this is the main part. This is the waveform generator. So here you've got your capacitor and resistor network here to allow you to adjust the frequency range. Over here, look, the duty cycle pins 4 and 5. They go through this little resistor network here, pulled up to 12 volts through that potentiometer. So that will allow you to adjust the duty cycle. The outputs here, sine wave out and triangle out, wave out. They're going through those header pins and off to this area over here. So that is all the ICL8038 part. And the square wave output comes out here on this pin nine square out. The sine and triangle go through this jumper header pin, so you can either select sine or triangle to go on to the next stage. And the next stage is this. So basically, this looks like it's a DC biasing op amp there. This is the non-inverting input, and yeah, it's adjusting a, a DC bias offset. So you've got nine volts here ground through these two resistors. You adjust this, and it allows you to adjust the offset of the output. Then over here, well, the input's then coming into the non-inverting input, so it's a non-inverting amplifier. So that is offset and amplification then, and that will be using the TL082 op-amp chip. So that's a high-level understanding of how all this works. Now let's go through all of these controls then, what all these potentiometers are doing. So first up, this one here, R1. So as I said, that's connected to these duty cycle pins, so R1 is definitely duty cycle control. And then R2, well, that's connected into sine wave adjust. And actually, R3 is the other sine wave adjust. So because the sine wave is basically a reformed triangle wave, these two adjustment pots allow you to kind of smooth out the curvature of that sine wave that it produces. We see that on the scope when we test it out. So R2 and R3 then is sine wave adjust. And down here we've got R4, which is all part of the resistor and capacitor network. So that will be the frequency adjustment. And just to note that JP2 over here, well that selects the various capacitors that are on the board. So you put a jumper here, it selects that capacitor, put a jump here, that one and so on. So that is the frequency range, JP2. Then the next potentiometer, this one, R5. So this is the amplification stage. So yeah, amplitude R5. 
and R6. As I said, that looks to be uh, it's applying a DC offset voltage and R6, the potentiometer, will allow you to adjust that offset. So R6 is the DC biasing. And finally, this JP1, well, that says header pins again, jumpers, which allows you to select between sine wave out or triangle out. And then that passes on to the next stage. The square wave out has got its own dedicated pin here. Look. So that permanently goes here to pin two and then pin three on this JP3 output terminal. Goes through all this amplification and DC biasing, but it will, it will either give you a sine or triangle depending on what you selected here. So JP1 then is sine stroke triangle selection. So now we know all of the controls then, let's uh, go back to the bench and test this thing out. Right, there you go, it's all plugged in, ready to go. I will have 12 volts coming in here when I turn the power on. Uh, I've got my yellow trace connected to the square wave output and my blue trace connected to the triangle stroke sine wave output, whatever you selected here. So just to recap the controls then, this is the duty cycle control, this is frequency, this is the DS DC bias adjustment, this is the amplitude, this allows you to select the frequency range, this allows you to switch between sine and triangle output, and these two here, they allow you to kind of trim and adjust the sine wave output. Okay, so let's turn it on. There we go, nice bright blue LED. Let's go across to the scope then and see what we're getting. Right, there you go, a nice clean triangle wave then, looks quite good. I'm starting with the triangle wave because that's where all of the other outputs, the, the sine and the square wave, are derived from. So this is our starting point, really. So I'm currently at two volts per division, and it's telling me this is currently at 64 hertz. So if I go to the controls and adjust the frequency, there you go, that's adjusted nicely up and down with the first potentiometer. There you go. By the way, the, the capacitor selection jumper is in the top position at the moment. And you can see the frequency adjusting there and there. If we go to the other controls, this is the DC bias adjustment, so it's lifting it up and down. You will, of course, get clipping if you're going beyond your rail limits. And then down again. And then the next one is the amplitude. Okay, nice. And this adjustment, well, this is one we're really interested in. This is the duty cycle adjustment. And you can see when I turn it, the rise time increases in proportion to the fall time decreasing and vice versa when I turn it the other way. You can see the triangle wave kind of tilting this way and tilting that way. So now we've got it back in the middle again. Let's turn on our square wave there. Then you can see that the square wave indeed is triggering. That's, that, that's the flip-flop. So when this, tri when this triangle wave gets to a certain threshold, the flip-flop triggers, goes low on the output. Then when this discharges to another threshold, the flip-flop triggers again, goes high on the output. So that's how we're getting the square wave. And you can see that that duty cycle adjustment, changing the rise and fall time proportionally, is affecting the duty cycle of our square wave. Brilliant. Now I'll change this output from the triangle to the sine wave by moving that jumper. Moving now. There, there you go, there's a sine wave, and let's amplify that a bit. And DC bias, quite handy having that uh, DC bias offset actually. And it's not bad sine wave, not too bad. Little bit of spike on the top there, uh, and at the bottom. So let's just turn this other trace off for a minute. Right, let's try these potentiometers for the sine wave adjust. So let's try the first one. Yeah, making it more pointed at the top and that's kind of rounding off the top you see the effect and then if i use the other one it's doing the same on the bottom of the sine wave but that's looks a bit better there and about there so there we go so yeah it's not too bad it's not a perfect sine wave but you know it's dirt cheap so i'd be happy with that so again, we can play with the frequency going up and down the frequency range and the DC bias and amplitude we've already done. Duty cycle, yeah, distorts the sine wave, of course. The rise and fall time on that duty cycle is based on that triangle wave. 
Right, I've turned off the second trace now and just monitoring this square wave output. So with the jumper in the very top position on the frequency range selection, so that's selecting the top capacitor if you like, and I have got the frequency selection potentiometer turned all the way anti-clockwise. So this is its slowest frequency, and you can see my scope is not going to give me a reading for that. So it's saying it's less than 2 hertz. So let's just stop that there, and we put our cursors on. And there you go, you can see one complete cycle is taking 587 milliseconds. So one divided by 0.587, so that is 1.7 hertz. And then if we turn the potentiometer all the other way, let's turn them cursors off again. There we go. Turn the potentiometer all the other, the other way, the frequency control, turn it right up. Just our scale now, we should get that static on there. There we go. And we've got, um, say, 80, 82 hertz there. Right, I've now moved the frequency range selection jumper to the second position down, and I've got the potentiometer all the way anti-clockwise, and I'm getting 6 hertz. So there's a big overlap in the range there, so I'm just making a note. So 6 hertz, and turn it the other way now. Increase the frequency. Get that on the screen a bit more. And... It's a bit all over the place at the moment. Well, let's just adjust my triggering. There we go. So 579 hertz. Okay, so that's much higher than before. 579. And I've got the frequency range jumper now in the third position. And again, the frequency potentiometer is all the way anti-clockwise. And I'm getting 120 hertz. And with it all the way clockwise, then I'm now getting 26. 7 kilohertz. Okay, and now with the jumper in the fourth and final position, the potentiometer all the way anti-clockwise, I'm getting 82 hertz. And all the way to the right, you can see I'm getting 303 kilohertz. Yeah, and the square wave is distorting a bit, as you can see. So that does give us a complete frequency range of 1.7 hertz to 303 kilohertz there. So what I want to do now then is measure the duty cycle, the on time versus the off time. And the AliExpress website says it can achieve roughly 2 to 95%. So let's see if that's true or not. So um, first of all, we need to get my measurement on. So add a measurement, rise time, and here we go, duty cycle down here. We're on channel one, that's good. Select, there you go, it's added it there. I'll clear all that stuff off the screen. So we're currently at 52 point something percent. Now I'm going to adjust the duty cycle dial on the on the board and let's let, I'll get it down to the lowest percentage I can. Right there you go, I've got it lower than 2%. I if I play around a bit more I can get that lower. But currently look, 1.82%. So now let's go the other way. All right, well, I'm getting 90.5 or something, so it's not quite up to spec. It's not 95%, but 90.5, okay. So there you go. That's the frequency ranges that we achieved then. So this JP2 is this jumper here. So top refers to the position it's shown, and bottom would be down there. Look. So we got from 1.7 hertz up to 303 kilohertz. And the duty cycle, well, it was 1.8, which is... Uh, better than the spec but only up to 90.5 the spec said up to 95 but it is say approximate so fair enough so that's the frequency generator from aliexpress based on the 8038 chip then here's all of the controls there that i've worked out and yeah it wasn't too bad it's, it's for the price it's pretty good actually so if you like this video then please click the like button and if you haven't done so already then please click subscribe too all right catch you later